ladies and gentlemen, I, I decided that I wasn't really going to present a lot of technical material uh, because we'll have a chance to do that in the parallel sessions and in other discussions and then wrap it all up later on. But I wanted to go with you into why I think what we're now doing is particularly important. I want to start with what I call the third global revolution, not evolution, but revolution. And the world we live in, and specifically this current moment when so many people are depressed, and rather the importance of science education, the need for the super course, and I want to end that we can make it happen. So the third global revolution started, rightly enough, here and in Iraq, the first global revolution was agriculture which allowed civilizations to grow. And uh, the second global revolution was the Industrial Revolution, which transformed the productive processes and changed the relationship between human beings and the product of their work. They were no longer artisans producing a finished product, but in fact collaborating with others in getting something done. So what is the third global revolution? It is really the knowledge revolution. I think it is fair to say that in the last 50 years or so, we have witnessed a shift from uh, brawn and muscle to brain, brain power. Uh, increasingly, that is what determines things, not the availability of raw materials. And as a result of that, intellectual property has become important and there's been a massive transformation in industry. New industries have been created, old ones have perished, there's been restructuring that's going on, and we increasingly realize that we are moving into a hyper-competitive world where the revolution that we are witnessing is just the end of the beginning. And if I may turn to my friend Vin Cerf and say, what have you wrought unto the world? And you and Bob Kane and others have really given us a tool that has transformed the pace at which things transform much more rapid than before. There's a larger number of scientists practicing today than there ever was in the world, and the amount of knowledge in some new fields is doubling practically every 18 months. The capacity to process the vast amounts of information is growing, and for some people in some societies, there is a, a fear of the speed at which we are dealing with uh, new discoveries, especially as we enter into the domain of the new biology and the potential implications of being able to tinker with the very building blocks of life. The problem, as I see it, is that this third global revolution, the knowledge revolution, starts with data, which when organized becomes information, when explained becomes knowledge. But knowledge by itself is not enough to really act. What we need is wisdom. Wisdom, regretfully, is a fairly limited commodity at present. For the world we live in is one where, yes, we are increasingly aware that we are part of a global whole, that the boundaries of nation states are less important than they've been before. We all know the problems, financial markets out of control, a global system that seems to crush the little guy, whether it is the pensioner in the United States or the poor farmer in places in Africa, or those who just don't have the competitive skills to stay with the ongoing rush of society, and those who had the misfortune of being born in places where their potential opportunities are extremely limited. We are still consuming energy on a very large scale and still using private cars that are inefficient and in producing a lot of uh, pollution. I remind people in the presence of my mentor, Dr. Tolba here, that the automobile uh, is over 100 years old now, and uh, 100 years ago, Henry Ford put out the Model T. It was getting 22 miles per gallon, and it was a flex engine. 100 years later, we're still getting 22 miles per gallon, and we don't even have a flex engine. So uh, it really uh, shows you, compared to, say, computing, communications, medicine, biology, uh, that has not been a very effective industry. 
Now, in the process of what we've done, also we've destroyed a lot of our patrimony in forests, we've polluted the air, and we've polluted the waters, and we've invested an enormous amount in the destructive potentialities of our weapons. I mean, if you think where we were a hundred years ago and where we are today in terms of what we can do with killing other people and destroying uh, things, it's absolutely enormously different. And uh, regretfully, we are still continuing to practice using these modern swords uh, in all sorts of horrible ways all over the world. And that really is a very moving picture that uh, I just couldn't resist putting up in front of these people considering the moment we are in right now. This little boy trying to salvage some books in the middle of the rubble of a bombing that's going on. Too many places still ignore basic human rights and I think I have to remind my friends with whom I deal a lot that it's not enough to celebrate the earth and diversity of its inhabitants that we must restore what we destroyed and we can see the possibilities and the possibilities that were invented because of the internet, because of the communication, because of the tools that we have to reach each other. The tools that enable us to celebrate in this last year that just ended a few days ago, the 60th anniversary of that most noble document which was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and recognize the human rights for all is an important uh, mandate that a global consensus was formed about this, that we had the Millennium Summit that set Millennium Development Goals, and I regret to say, my friends, that the most important goal of all, starting with not education, not health, but starting with basic food. We said that we would cut the number of hungry people from 850 million to 425 by 2015 instead of which we meet halfway in 2008 and we discover that the number has gone up to 950 million and the summit meeting in Rome says and it's likely to reach a billion. What is going on? Why are we spending 16 times more on military hardware than we are on development? How can we harness all this knowledge revolution to do that. Well, for one thing, we need peace. And I was telling uh, Gil Oman yesterday, I have a beautiful quotation from a guy who should know. Of course, you all recognize Napoleon Bonaparte. At the end of his life, Napoleon Bonaparte said this statement. You know what astonished me most in the world? The inability of force to create anything. In the long run, the sword is always beaten by the spirit. Well, the spirit translated from French esprit, which could be mind or knowledge or whatever you like. So in the end, the idea is what counts. And the essential goals of peace and justice must be pursued by all of us in our daily activities as well as in our societal activities. No security without peace, no peace without justice, no justice without equity and no equity without inclusion. Now that being said, however, the future can be great. The technology will help connect young people everywhere and expand our brain's reach beyond anything we can imagine today. It's a whole lot more of new things. But what about this current moment? The global markets and the knowledge-based economy have led us, due to the absence of wisdom, into a headlong rush into disaster. Yes, people were looking at trillion dollar markets, but the financial markets really blew a fuse and we all know the results of that. But why do I say there is a silver lining? Well, for one thing, ideologies have been shaken. And now we stand rethinking the role of what is the proper role of government, the proper role of the private sector, and the proper role of regulation. Secondly, we have a new administration in the USA that is willing to look for multilateral solutions to work with other countries around the world. And we have a greater awareness around the planet of global environmental problems as well as these developmental problems that require international cooperation. So the stage is set for people to rethink a new approach, almost just as it was at the time of the rubble of the Second World War when people invented the UN 
invented the Bretton Woods system, invented all of these international collaborative systems. The best outcome for us in the poorer countries is new opportunities for the South, but only if the South can master science education. And that's, of course, where we come to why we need the super course. Well, first of all, there's inequality of access to resources. The difference between rich and poor countries in income is 40 times richer, but in research, the rich countries invest 220 times more per capita every year, 22,000% more every year per person in the rich versus the poor countries. And that, of course, would increase the divide between the rich and the poor, unless the poor can get their act together. There's inequality of access to equipment. This is a, a preschool in uh, pre-kindergarten, it's kindergarten, pre-primary school in Germany, and this is a primary school in Africa. Germany, sub-Saharan Africa. But to the rescue, some people are coming up with a $100 computer and forcing down the prices of the tools that may com make that communication possible. There is the inequality of access to knowledge. The teachers that are teaching, as Ron Laporte said, need recent, correct, and easily available material. And it is not usually at hand, but we can make it happen through the super course. So the future question is, can we actually overcome these obstacles and recognizing in the countries themselves the importance of science education? We have about a billion students right now in the school systems of the developing world that are about to come onto the labor market and behind them one and a half billion before the population stabilizes. Many of them are learning in these very poor conditions without the simplest and ba most basic forms. They don't even have chairs to sit on. Forget about computers and so on. Very limited abilities. Okay, this is from Egypt. Chairs are there. Computers aren't but computers are in the school, so the teacher could access them, and the kids are eager, and that's important. And now we know, increasingly, from the U.S., major efforts have been done to think about how science education should be advanced. This picture tells it all. This is not a science-based teaching, in a sense. There is no effort to allow the student to learn by discovering for themselves. This is a teacher forcing rote memorization. This, however, is a picture of my friend Bruce Alberts, who came several times here to the library, he was then director, the president of the National Academy of Sciences. And this is a big statue of Einstein and a visiting class of primary school students. Science is friendly. Science is something that people should enjoy. And, uh, whether it's a small child from a primary school or the president of the National Academy of Sciences sitting in the lap of the greatest scientist of the 20th century is not a bad way to start. Now, in every country there are objections to science, and this year is the year of Darwin, 2009, so we're going to have more of these objections. But nevertheless, by and large, there is no doubt that education is growing and there is a need for science education to grow equally in the developing countries as it is in the rich countries. This picture again tells it all. It is the opposite of the picture with the blackboard and the ruler. It is children discovering for themselves, learning, children following a teacher. I think these, uh, these pictures are very telling. They're children following a teacher who's giving a lecture. And these are younger people who are following distance learning. So structured learning is one way. Instruction is one, structured learning is another. And with the increasing availability of these cheaper computers, self-learning will also become important. I'm not sure we're quite ready to go that fast yet, but yes, my friends, we want to go as fast as possible and start as early as possible. That, I think, should be part of the rule. So the super course will allow the teachers to organize their own material. As Ron said, it's for free. Nobody tells you what to do. You can take whatever you want. You can take a whole lecture or individual slides, tailor the lecture to his or her needs, and stay in touch in an easy and accessible fashion 
with the latest in the area of science, with a community of scholars, a community of practice in the field that you're in, through this marvelous invention, the Internet, which puts at our fingertips the entire global knowledge availability. In the Library of Alexandria, we've recognized this from the beginning, and everywhere we have computers as well as reading tables. So we're really talking about the global partnership, anchored here, hopefully, in the Library of Alexandria to provide that. This is, these are the statistics that Ron went through. That is the DVD, which I hope uh, Dr. Faham, everybody will get uh, one, and please share it with others as much as you want. And to make the super course work, we need to build these communities of practice. It has been done. Ron and his colleagues did it in epidemiology. Can we not do it in agriculture, in engineering, and in, in uh, uh, environment as well? I think we can, starting with these four. Then let's see where we go. We want to organize the, not only collect the best lectures, but organize them in a user-friendly way, make them available for free, constantly update the information, and that requires the scientific communities of practice. Now, the availability of the lectures and the, and the, and the the rating of the lectures will come as a byproduct of the regular work of practicing lecturing scientists, because that's what they will be doing. So why the Library of Alexandria? Well, I'd like to say that it's nice to be here at the very spot of the old Library of Alexandria, dedicated to science, but this time born digital, thanks to the effort of Dr. Magdi Nagy and Dr. Noha Adli, who I think deserve a hand. They and their team have really built a first-class digital institution here. So there is a symbolic value, but there's also a more practical reason to choose the PA. For one thing, here in Egypt, and Egypt has an influence in this part of the world, the PA is becoming a notable institution. We receive over a million visitors a year, and this is actually a science program. This picture was with Hoda and Mekati on the eclipse. But uh, we do a lot of that. So it shows you that there's a lot of hunger for people to learn about science. Uh, we have over 600 events. That's another science lecture that's being shown here. This was uh, done uh, with Dr. Faham. And this is an international gathering, many other things, many scientific conferences. About 800,000 visitors annually just come to visit for the day. And of these are thousands of children. And we have about 350,000 reader visits every year. Our websites receive over 200 million hits, probably more by now, and hopefully with the super course it will add a lot more. We have a complex of lively institutions, and through this connectivity we can say that the digital future is here, and that we are proud to work with those who will be the artisans of a better future. So can we really transform the teaching of science in the developing world? I say yes. And I say dare to dream and dare to be bold, and I'll give you two examples of why you should dare to dream and dare to be bold. We can do things differently. We don't have to rely on the old-fashioned ways of sending books to remote areas and then wondering about whether you can send the next volume or not. We can succeed in doing this. And the two examples I want to give you is the first one, Antarctica. Now, Antarctica is, of course, the continent at the bottom, which is very, very cold, as you know. It's a very big place. And when it was discovered in the recent sense of being discovered, people wanted to bring in the bulldozers and uh, look for oil, or look for factories, minerals, etc. Lots of money was going to be made. Some people talked about military bases there. and. At the time, my late friend Jacques-Yves Cousteau and other friends said, no. And I said, what do you mean no? I said, this is a pristine area. Let us keep it only for wildlife and for science. And somebody said to him, do you seriously believe you want to keep a whole continent just for a bunch of penguins? And he said, yes. And guess what? They did. They succeeded. The Antarctica Agreement was signed and Antarctica remained pristine as much as any part of this planet could remain pristine to this day. Second example. 1963, a great man, Martin Luther King, 
stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and gave a moving lecture, in which the theme was, I have a dream, and in which he said, I have a dream that my children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Well, dreams can be realized. 45 years to the day, Barack Obama stood before 76,000 people accepting the Democratic nomination to be President of the United States and went on to win with over 360 electoral votes to be the first President of the United States elected with no attention to the color of his skin. He taught us from his autobiography the importance of the audacity of hope and to think that we can do things different and we can change. And a great lady, Margaret Mead, said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. It is indeed the only thing that ever has. And so, who are this small group of thoughtful, committed citizens? All of you here, all of you who are here today are the nucleus of that group that will transform the BA Science Super Course from a dream into reality that will take the application that Ron Laporte and his colleagues forged for epidemiology and health into the bigger domain of science. Uh, believe me, if we work all together, there's so much we can do for a whole generation and for the whole world. And we, with your help, right here in the Library of Alexandria, will provide a base for that. And we have a small team. It may look very small compared to the competition, which may be very large, but you know what? We're going to surprise you. <laughs> Thank you.